Today I'm sharing some acrylic painting tips while painting this mantis so that I can make somebody cry. This is becoming a bit of a habit. My friend Cory over at Aqua Studios wanted to surprise his girlfriend with a painting of her mantis. Cory is really really bad at taking usable reference photos. Ask me how I know. So we got our friend Michael Vargas in on the surprise. Michael is an amazing photographer. The link to his website will be in the video description. He specializes in macro photos, so that was perfect for this project. A couple of weeks later, and I had the painting ready. You let the you didn't know. Hey guys. Hey. What's going that one. on? That one. Who's this? That one. That one. Hey, you should hold that for me. And then pose with it. You're, you can look at it if you want, but just for a minute. everyone have sad tears that makes it somehow okay that I keep making people cry right if you are supporters over on patreon head over where you've got the one hour version of this lesson available for you now if you're unfamiliar with patreon for as little as four dollars a month you get access to all of my longer videos I have a new one every single week and over 300 available as soon as you sign up if you're not sure if patreon is a fit for you you can head over to my patreon video library I will have a link in the video description where you can check out what tutorials I have for this one, I started with the background, which is pretty usual for me with working with acrylics. It is easier if you paint the entire background, like the subject's not even there, than to try to paint around fine details in your subject. It will just save you so much time and you get a smoother, more seamless transition between the subject and that background. So I use the airbrush on this one with the FX texture effect, that is that stencil you're seeing right there to create that sky. I started with titanium white and then I just did what is essentially a glaze. It's a translucent layer on top of it. So you can still see all that texture I previously had done. If I had used these pink, help my brain shut down, the pink and the orange colors directly onto the blue, you would have just gotten this sort of muddy brown color. It would have just tinted the color there. It wouldn't have actually come out orange and magenta. So by putting the white down first and then putting the, the more translucent colors on top, it lets it really stand out. That white is very opaque. Once that is on there, I'm going to go ahead and you can see I splattered my stars on with a palette knife and a stiff brush, just flick that white paint down. Now I'm going to create a vignette look right around the edges. And I'm only using the airbrush on this piece for the background. It's just going to save a ton of time for this, this sort of thing. That background is so fast to do with an airbrush, but it would have taken me days if I sat there and hand painted it. A few more white, white highlights. Then I'm going to go ahead and paint. I wanted a tropical feel on this one. So I want some mountains in the distance. We're going to use the same blue that I used in that background for the mountains that are farther away. And then as I move my way forward, I'll get a bit of a green tint to those and then darken those up around the edge as well. I don't want the background to really be the focus or at least not the mountains to be the focus on this guy. Now we can paint our little alien. So we're going to start with just the green base on the leaf. That is one of my plants. It's a Raphidophora tetrasperma that she's sitting on. And I'm gonna start with a solid green. Now the solid green is going to be very flat. Common question I get from people is how do you know what color to use? Or I need to know what color you're using to make my painting look the same. You really don't. Here, let's say you use the same exact color I did. Well, I've gotta mix it. I've gotta get highlights and shadows. The values are what matter. If you're having a hard time making your work look realistic, the color is not the issue. The issue are your values. Are you getting your lights light enough, your darks dark enough? And that's what you're gonna see me do as I go through here. I'm going to really work on getting nice contrast between those light and dark greens. 
Now here, as I go to the darker greens, I'm just adding a bit of black to it. That is a color that you can darken with black. There are certain colors. If you want it to be a bit darker, black would not be the, the choice I would go with. Let's say you're trying to make something that's yellow or orange darker. I would shade that with a purple or a magenta instead. But in the case of green, the black works just fine. I could have shaded it with purple or magenta as well, but black isn't going to create a horrible muddy color mess like you're typically going to get if you mix it in with orange and or uh, yellow to try to darken that up. So now I'm coming through. We've got some highlights around the edge here. And see all the variation in there. There's not just one perfect color of green. If I just paint it green, it's going to look flat. I don't have a even semi-realistic -re looking leaf in that case. So here using my aqua color going around some of the edges, that is something that it's more stylized. It's not that that makes the leaf look more realistic. I just love that look of having this outer edging with that teal or aqua color. And I get that by mixing phthalo blue, phthalo green, and a bit of white. Now onto our subject, I've mixed a tan color and I'm gonna use this as the base. I, this isn't a paint by number, so notice how I paint the whole background solid and then I can go on top of that with detail. When you're painting with acrylics, it's really a layering process. And so if you learn nothing else from me, just pay attention to the layering that we do to get that end result. It's not just, and that's the biggest thing to get people to stop trying to do, or it'll make your work look a lot better. It's not just put the right color in the right place. Watch how we layer everything. So we've got that solid tan color. We need that to dry before we start drawing in all of those details. I'm using a hair dryer here to speed that along. We can let that set. While that sets, I'm gonna go ahead and add some more shading on the leaf here. So I'm using black and I'm thinning it with a bit of water and using a clean brush to smudge it around. So I apply the paint with one brush, use a clean brush, smudge it out, and that gives me that nice, soft, a wet into wet look, even though that paint that I'm blending it into is completely dry. I get all the shading in there. And so this goes back to what I was saying earlier about it's not about finding the perfect color. You could use a completely different green than I used, yet still have your leaf look pretty much the same if your values are correct. Are your darks dark enough, your lights light enough? Adding some whites next to the black. Now, another cool thing when you're painting, if you have something and you're like, my, I'm as dark as I can go, but it still doesn't look dark enough, paint what's next to it lighter and that will make your darks appear darker. Same thing in reverse. If something you've got something really bright, really light, but it doesn't feel bright enough, paint what's next to it darker and that will make your brights appear brighter. Now, I missed a huge chunk in my video there. I apologize. I went through and drew out all the little detail, and then I'm just using black. I'm keeping this really simple in this case, using black to draw out all of those little, the little bits in there, but it's still flat. So now I've got to come through and work on those values. Right now, I just have base tan and black. So let's get some white in there. And actually, this isn't just white. That's unbleached titanium white. So it's more of a cream color. That way, if I need something even brighter, I can use straight titanium white and get those brightest, brightest highlights. And all these little details, lots of little dots and smudges. And you may be hesitant when you see something with that much detail, like, oh my gosh, that's too hard. That's going to be too much work. It's actually easier to make something very busy look good than something that's very simple. It's time consuming. It certainly takes more time and more patience. But as far as skill wise, you may look at something really busy thinking, oh my gosh, it's too much. I'm not good enough for that yet. No, you just, as long as you're patient enough, it is going to be so much easier for you to make that really busy thing, lots of detail look good than something very simple because all that busyness, all that detail, will hide mistakes that you can't hide easily on something that's more simple. So don't like kind of push away the idea of working on something that has a lot more detail because it's not as hard as you think it is. It's just time consuming. So I want to get some orange in here, let her stand out. And I'm just doing this as a glaze, which means a decent amount of water, smaller amount of paint. And I'm using paint that is fairly translucent so that it just tints the color. You can still see all that detail I painted, I'm just tinting the color. Get a little bit of magenta in here now. So now we can get that nice, rich color. And this is interesting too. She doesn't have that much magenta or that much orange in her. As long as my values are correct, 
it still looks like her. It just looks like she's got different light hitting her. So that's another thing that goes back to when we worry so much about getting the perfect color. I could paint her purple and she'll still look realistic that her mom will still think it's the same mantis. It's just, it would just look like she's under purple lighting. By adding these different tinted colors, you're just changing the lighting. As long as your values and the rest of those details are correct, it still looks like the same subject. I say this all the time. I could paint a tiger in purple and still have it look very realistic because my values would be correct. It would just look like a tiger under purple lighting. Don't get too hung up on using the perfect exact color. If you wanna get hung up on something, get hung up on getting your values correct. That is what you should focus on first, that it is more important. I mean, color matters, but not nearly as much as your values. Light's light enough, dark's dark enough. Get those various values. The leaf is a great example here. Look at how many shades I have in there. It's really just the, I mostly, I believe, used hooker green or hooker's green. But then I've got the lights and darks in there so I get those values. It, I could use a completely different tube of green paint and it would have still worked. Going around those edges with that aqua color I love so much. And I'm not just outlining everywhere. I'm just hitting a few areas where it would look like there's some of that sky reflecting on her. Now we're gonna get some water droplets. So I start with the black paint, we'll smudge that out. And then once that black is dry, I can come through with my white highlights. And I have a full video. I'll put a pop-up that shows exactly step-by-step -step how to paint those bubbles. They're really, really easy. few final details in the shading. Again, just adjusting those values, make my darks a little bit darker so the light areas are pushed out. Same thing on the leaf. Get a little bit of shading in there. And that is it for this one. And like I said, all that detail, it takes time. It is a bit tedious. You just need to go into it knowing you're going to have to be patient and paint all those little details and you're going to work this up in layers. Don't, don't stray away from those details though. It will, one, it's great practice. If you struggle with using a liner brush, that something like this is going to be great practice for that. You'll pretty much master the liner brush by the time you're done. A tip on using the liner brush too, and I have a video, I'll have a, a card pop up so you can see some tips on that. But when you use the liner brush, always remember, and this is actually true with all of your brushes, the harder you push, the thicker your line is going to be. If you want a thin line, you're just barely going to let the tip of those bristles touch your canvas. With the liner brush, you're also going to thin that out a bit with water. So definitely check out that video if that is something you struggle with. I show you how I do that. Now, if you follow me on MeWe or if you were there for last week's live stream, I told you guys I found a jumping spider in my hallway. So here's your warning. If you don't want to see cute fluffy spider photos, this would be the time to click away from this video. I know some people don't enjoy spiders like I do. So anyway, this is a really cute one. It's like the cutest cute anyway moving on so i named her amelia i found her in my hallway last week and she was starving and you can tell they're starving because her abdomen was really really tiny she needed water she needed needed food I already have crickets here for my frog, so this made it really easy. I decided to go ahead, I put her in a little cup, I gave her a drink of water on a Q-tip, she was super thirsty, so she drank that, and then I gave her a cricket, and I mean immediately. This little one, and I did identify her as a female, she's a tan jumping spider, she was so hungry and thirsty, and she's doing great, so I decided, you know, if you wanna live in my house, I'm okay with that, but I need to be able to provide you with food and water easily, so I went and purchased her a really nice enclosure, and I set it up and I, I just, I'm so, I think it's adorable. It sits on my desk now, but I made a little art desk and, or I really bought this little miniature art desk has the little palette on it and I got the little miniature iced tea because I love iced tea and that is sitting there and she's got a nice little tree to climb on. I am waiting. I've got a little walnut hide that will, it uses magnets. It'll stick up at the top so she can sleep in that at night. Right now she sleeps in her tree, but okay, I think this was enough of a warning for anyone who needed to cloak away. Let's look how cute she is. Oh my God, look at the floof. Is she not adorable? I do need to practice getting macro photos. So technically all, on this photo, she was upside down. I just flipped the photo so we could see her cute little face. And yes, this is Amelia. 
Jumping spiders are really cool. They're very, very tiny, and they're really not afraid of people. She's she's seems to be as interested at watching me as I am in watching her. Well, that and I'm the lady who keeps bringing her food, so she likes that too. I've wanted one for a while, so I had already done my research on them. But the reason that I held back is they don't live a whole a long time. They're typically on a female one to three years. A male would be shorter. She is a female. I have no idea how old she is. And I knew I get so attached to my animals. I was afraid I would get super attached and be so sad But um, when she, you know, eventually lived out her life. And in this case, I have no idea how old she is. But when I found her in the hallway, it was kind of one of those, oh, I've wanted one of you guys for a while. You're sitting here waiting for me to bring you food. Okay, fine. You can live on my desk. The care for these guys, very, very simple. They, she needs to have her enclosure misted with dechlorinated water once or a day or so. I also keep a bit of wet sphagnum moss in the back to keep her humidity nice in there. Her enclosure has a lot of ventilation. That's also important. And then just some places to walk around and, and sleep. And they're not picky. It's not something like my red-eyed tree frogs that have this super, like there's just so much involved in, in keeping a proper enclosure for the red-eyed tree frogs or for my reef tank. And she eats the crickets that are too small for those red-eyed tree frogs. I have to keep crickets on hand all the time for them anyway. So it works out really well. She's a really good eater, but you only feed them about four, every four days or so. You don't want to feed them too often. It does shorten their lifespan if they're eating too much. But there we go. That is Amelia. She's my new desk buddy. Have you subscribed yet? If not, I have a handy button right there. It's round, has an orange arrow going towards it. If you click on that, YouTube still probably won't notify you, but you know, it makes me happy that people are subscribing. Also click on the bell notification. There's a better chance of YouTube notifying you when a video goes up. I also have an email newsletter that I send out once a week, letting you know what videos that YouTube didn't let you know about and whatever live streams I have scheduled, updates, news, art, uh, art motivational tips, that sort of thing. So yeah, you should sign up for the email newsletter after you click subscribe and, and the notification that may or may not work.